Welcome to Pioneer Congregational Church. This is our Sunday morning online worship. We're glad you could join us today. We're getting into the season where it's less about the events in the life of Christ and more about how the church learns how to be church. So at this time with the current situation in our society, it's very appropriate. Today we want to be the church and reject racism. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. Gracious God, you call us to renew our faith in your powerful love. You assure us that your grace can heal and empower our bodies and spirits. We come to you and join with other people of faith to become whole again and to work together to transform our society into one where we all experience your love made real in our lives. Keep us, we pray, dedicated to that transformation as followers of the way of Jesus. Amen. In our first lesson this morning, we see that the promise of God that brought about the people of Israel was fulfilled by a child born of Sarah. Our first lesson is Genesis 18, 1 to 5, and 9 to 15. The Lord appeared to Abram by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, 
do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. Later they said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abram and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh.
In our second lesson today, we see that the examples of faith in our sacred text could also be full of doubts about God ever bringing into being the promised world their faith led them to seek. Our lesson is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 to 16. By th faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as numerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. There is a banner that hangs on our entryway into our sanctuary and is one of the first things you see as you come in the doors by our office. It starts off with, be the church. Then it has several other phrases about what that means to be the church. One of them that is particularly important for us today is reject racism. As it happens, I was reading a book on a totally different subject when I had one of those aha moments that explained how America got to this point where we had racism so embedded not only into our secular lives but even into our religious lives. It is still true today that the most segregated time in American society is Sunday morning. That's when we separate from one another and we each choose to be with our own people, whatever that meant, whatever that still means. But one of the things that was revealed in this study that was done actually on a different topic was the common understanding that people had. As theologians, they of course gave it a name. That's what theologians do. They called it common sense theology. And what that said was what is, is what God has ordained to be. The order that we have in our society and now is what God has wanted all people to have in their society. So the fact that there was male domination, that there was white privilege, all of those things were because that's what God ordained, because that's what was. Now the problem with that is that may seem like common sense, but it's not really what God has called us to do. In our text this morning, we heard the story of Abraham. Abraham was told to leave his father's house and go to the land that God had promised him. 25 years later, after Abraham had left his father's house and was a sojourner in the land that God had promised him. He finally had a son through his wife, Sarah. And even when Abraham died years later, the only part of that land that he possessed was the tomb in which he buried Sarah. So he left his father's house. He obeyed the call of faith, but he never got to see the results of that promise fulfilled. At this time of year, we often, as Christians, talk about Jesus calling his disciples, and they're called to follow him. 
And Jesus has said that the kingdom of heaven is near. But it never quite comes. It never is established here on earth, that perfect place where God's love is made real for all people. But common sense would tell us what is is what God meant to have happen. Of course, tyrants and megalomaniac rulers have always known that what they needed to present to people is the idea that what is is what has always been and therefore is what is supposed to be. And so we hear little about the Hittite Empire. It had relatively enlightened laws. It had prosperity that was shared much more equally among its citizens, but it was wiped out, and the memory of it was deliberately erased for the most part. We even see in the stone carvings and the stella and the tombs in Egypt that one pharaoh tried to wipe out the memory of another pharaoh and put his own brand over all the accomplishments all the buildings that were created by his predecessor so that people would think that he was the one that had created all this grandeur. As long as we can get people to be ignorant of the past, we can convince them that what is now is what has always been and what God has said should always be. That's the way of rulers, that's the way of tyrants. But it's repeated in other subtle ways as well. When you want to change society and then you want to establish that the way you think society ought to be. Modern movements politically don't tell you get someone to run for president. They tell you get your people who are like-minded to run for school boards. Get your people on the text textbook committees so that you can write history the way you want to present it in a way that always shows that your ideas were the correct ideas and that the way you want the world to be is what should be. And so we want to erase the past. And we forget the adage, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And we forget that we are called to be people of faith. We are called to go out to transform the world, not to accept it as is. And so we look at the world as it is now. And we have to stop thinking what God ordained is always good and then define that what God has ordained as the order that already exists. And we need to take instead the idea that God has called us to make a new world, a better world, here where we live, here where we experience relationships with human beings of all stripes, here where we see that what is is full of injustice, is full of oppression, is full of things that need to be changed if God's love is ever going to be real, is ever going to be the experience of people in our world. And so we need to take another look at our society and at ourselves. And I know studying racism, my personal reaction usually is, well, I'm not a racist. And many people who are white like me, who have lived with the white privilege all their lives, honestly feel that they're not racist. But they don't understand the systemic racism that has given them their life of privilege. They don't even see it as privilege. After all, it is what is. Therefore, isn't that what God ordained? Instead, we need to look at the systemic racism that so corrupts our institutions, that puts 
people of one kind or another at the bottom. And we get the ideas of thinking like, well, we can cut services to the poor because the poor already know how to do without. So they can just do without a little bit more rather than take anything away from the rich who have more than what they know how to spend. We can continue to oppress women. We can continue to marginalize people of different sexual orientations and gender identities. But most importantly for us today, we're asked to look at the idea of systemic racism. How is it that it has infiltrated our policies as we make laws that criminalize people and then we enforce those laws more on some portions of our population than others. So we can honestly say, well, there's so many criminals in that society, in that race. But we can say that because we created that. We created that by the way we made the laws and the way we enforced them. I remember growing up in a small town in West Texas, and my brother and I looked at the way our classmates were living in all four grades of our high school, and we realized that there were probably only three boys in the whole high school that did not get drunk regularly. And of course, that's underage drinking. That's illegal. But they were white. No one was going to be cited. No one was going to be labeled a criminal. It was just going to be said, boys will be boys. Now that would not be the case with systemic racism in place if we had the minorities that are in other places where different parts of cities are, have the law enforced on them so that they're made criminals, they're given records where others, it would have just been shrugged off. So that kind of systemic racism is with us. And when people call in because they see a black man and they think that black man is threatening because that's where their mindset is, that's what they're taught to believe, that black man may just be jogging that teenage boy may just be walking through a certain area because he just got some candy from the local store. He could just be sitting in his car, but they're seen as threatening. The call goes into the police that this person is threatening, and the police come with that idea that there is a threat. They come ready to take down a criminal, and in their mind, that's who that person is, no matter who that person actually is or what that person is doing. If that person is black and has been reported as being a threat, that's what they are in the minds of those who enforce the law. So that kind of systemic racism needs to be addressed. But we have to look at more than just our police, more than just our laws. We had to have to look at our economics. We have to look at our education. We have to look at our housing. In all of those ways, we find a way to enforce our white privilege, to preserve it, not even thinking about what that does to those who are not white, those who are in a different ethnic minority. And so we are called to be transformers of our world. We are called to be those who face injustice and seek to correct it. We are called to be the change we want to see in the world. That means we reject racism, whether it's put into our systems and it gives us all the privilege that we could ever desire or whether it's blatantly displayed personally to other people. We need to reject racism 
racism as it is systematically shown in our institutions is something we can address. It's not whether you personally have animosity to a certain person of color or a different ethnicity. It's whether you're going to be complicit in the systemic racism that exists all around us. It's the air we breathe. Will we clean up that air? We are called by faith to leave our Father's house. Our fathers may have lived the best lives they knew how. They may have fought to correct some injustices. But we see that there are still injustices that need to be addressed. And so we are called to build that kingdom that has not yet existed on this earth, that kingdom where God is ruling, where God's love is a litmus test for our, the structure of our institutions, not just our actions, not just the things we believe in our hearts, but the practices that we have day to day. So it's not common sense. It's a call of faith. That's what we hear. And that's what we as people of faith are guided by as we seek to right the wrongs in this world, as we seek to be the church and reject racism. Amen. In our prayers today, we want to remember Betsy and Clyde's grandson who's having a hard time right now. We want to remember two of our younger members, Cheyenne and Cody, who are going to the funeral of their stepfather, step-grandfather. And we ask God to keep them safe as they travel and to bring comfort to the family. We pray for a friend of Cynthia's who's having kidney transplant that has been postponed because of COVID, but now is taking place. We pray for Jerry Bedencourt and his family at the loss of his daughter. We pray for Elaine's friend who is on a third round of chemo. We pray for all our community that is in nursing homes today. We pray that God keep them safe. We also offer prayers reports for John Ulmer's mother, Elena, who is recovering nicely and has gone back to her senior living facility. We remember those daughters of our members who are expecting children within the next few months. We offer praise with Lance and Mike that their son is recovering from his injuries. And we offer praise that Ellen Ardenogel is home and recovering now. So all of these prayers of concerns and offerings of praise are for our members. We include, of course, our society at large. We remember especially those who are hit the hardest by the racism 
that is so endemic in our society. We want to help our cities, our states, our nation, and indeed we have discovered our world to heal from this attitude that allows us to treat other human beings as non-human beings. We offer all these things in prayer to a God who is greater than we are. And we place these into the hands of our God, however we name that God in our hearts, as we pray together. Loving and gracious God, we know that your ways are not our ways. And that's a very good thing. Because our ways reveal too many times how unjust we can be, how unloving we can be to one another. And so we ask that you help us to come together, to see our common humanity and to find ways in which all people might be blessed, in which all lives might be lived fully. And especially open our eyes to see what has been clouded so many times, that black lives matter. We thank you for the care that you have given to those that we know and love. We ask that you would continue to be with those who are struggling with the issues in their life, overcoming injuries and illnesses. We thank you for the progress that has been made in the lives of others. Grant them healing. But no matter what the source of conflict, no matter what the source of pain might be, help us each know at all times that you are present, that your spirit is there as a source of strength, that your spirit is there as a source of peace, that your spirit is there to guide us to live in such a way that we transform this world by loving one another as we have been called to do. We ask then your blessings upon us as we seek to be the church. We ask your blessings upon those leaders who will help create the laws and form the policies that will hopefully will transform our institutions to be less racist. We ask that you would hear our prayers through the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In our announcements today, we want to let you know that we are seeking ways where we can be the church, where we can still be in ministry. And we're glad to see the response to those who have viewed this online worship, who have read the midweek meditations, who have continued to support us financially as we carry on as we continue to keep the building ready for worship to open up again. And we are actively trying to find ways where we can present a worship service that is safe and meaningful for people who attend. In light of the present unrest, in light of the needs that are there in our community, I want to let you know that next Sunday, the 21st, no, yeah, the 21st. I'll get my calendar out in a minute. Whatever the next Sunday is after you see this. We're going to open up the building for a time for meditation where we can be socially distanced in our large sanctuary, where we can have music that will help us to meditate and I will be here to deliver prayers and different meditations 
It will not be a worship service. We will not try to sing. We will not be exchanging physical handshakes and hugs. We will keep remembering the pandemic that is among us. But we need to be able to come to a place where we can find peace, where we can know that we are supported by other like-minded people. So we will open up our facilities next Sunday, the 21st, at 2 o'clock for an hour of meditation. And we hope that this is something that we can do and that will help us individually to find peace and to find healing, to find empowerment, to go out and be the church. Thank you.
Now may the God who has called us to live lives of faith be with us. May the Spirit demonstrate to us what that faith looks like so that we can be the church. And may the Christ whose way we follow continue to be with us as we go out into our world to be the transformers of a society so that it looks like the love of God we know. Mm -hmm.